Good morning, everyone. It is so good to see everybody. This morning we have, a, as Kylie said, a full house, and that's always exciting. Glad that you're here. Let's take our Bibles, everybody, and open to Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1. So we're going to go to the second book in our Old Testament. Exodus chapter 1. While you're turning there, uh, I will remind you that uh, this is the time of year where the elders meet with the men and women, and they met with the men last week. They'll meet with the women this afternoon at 5 o'clock, so please put it on your schedule to be there. They'll share some important things with you and give you the opportunity to give feedback and ideas for the future. So please put that on your schedule to be here at the building at 5 this afternoon. You'll be blessed by that meeting. In addition to that, the men have already received this, but I'm going to let everyone know there will be a survey that's been sent out to most of the men here, and it's going to be sent out to every email address that we have. We ask that you just fill that out and send it back to us. It's four short questions, and you can put as much detail in those answers as you would like, but that will help us as we begin to cast a vision for the future here and what we want to accomplish in the next few years here at Bowden. So please take the time, you'll receive that this afternoon, to fill that out so that we can have your information on your ideas and uh, suggestions. Exodus chapter 2, uh, Exodus chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. These, these are the names of the sons of Israel, who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun and Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities in Pethon and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves, and made their lives bitter with hard service, in mortar and brick, and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Sifra and the other Pua, when you serve as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, you, uh, she shall live. But the Hebrew midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and let the male children live? The Hebrew midwives said to Pharaoh, because of the Hebrew women, they're not like the Egyptian women, for they're vigorous, and they give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew strong. And because the midwives feared God, and he gave them, fa he gave them families, then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. You and I are faced with decisions every day. And those decisions often come down to a, a choice between what is right and what is wrong. As we are in the car and we pull up to an intersection and the light turns yellow as we approach, we have the choice. Do I hit the brake or do I hit the gas? Some of us were taught that yellow meant brake and some of us meant taught that yellow meant accelerate. We're given choices every day. Maybe the case for you is that you've faced a choice before where you've walked into a store and on the ground in front of you was a 20, a 50, or a hundred dollar bill. You have to ask yourself the question, what will I do with the money that lays in front of me? A choice between what is right and what is wrong. 
Some of us, as we go to the mailbox, open the mailbox, and with many other things, are the most dreaded things to receive in the mail, our bills. <laughs> and we open the bills, and we read them, and we see, and kick at the wind, and punch at the wind, knowing that inflation has affected us just like everybody else, and we think, do I pay my bills or not? Hopefully every person decides, I'm going to pay my bills. But we're faced with a choice to do right or to do wrong. Just this past week on uh, the Bowden Community Facebook page, someone said, hey, I found a phone. Does this belong to anyone? And they turned it in so that the person who owned the phone could find it. And that person went and got it. Every day, as we walk through this life, you and I face decisions where we must choose to do what is right or to do what is wrong. The cool thing about our choices is that they are weaving for us a tapestry of the life that we've lived. Every choice that we make is another stitch in the tapestry that makes up the life that you and I live. And so even though some decisions in life may seem small and other decisions may seem huge, we may can see the consequences immediately of some decisions, but we don't immediately see the consequences of other decisions every single day. You and I are faced with choices. And we must decide whether we will do what is right or what is wrong. What I would like to talk to you about this morning from Exodus chapter 1 is choosing to do what is right. Regardless of the circumstances, the consequences, or the challenge. You and I each day choosing to do the right thing. In Exodus chapter 1, if you'll remember, we're coming to the close of Genesis. And Joseph has provided for not only the people of Israel, but Egypt overall, because God gave him a, a dream. And God said, there's going to be seven years where the grain and the harvest is going to be great. And y'all are going to have tons of food. But then there's going to come a seven-year drought. And Joseph, you need to be the person that prepares for this seven-year drought. And Joseph does that. He stores up in the seven years of plenty, keeps grain stored away. And then when the seven years of drought come, Joseph is able through the nation of Egypt to provide not only for Egypt and the world, but for his own family who would become the people of Israel. As Joseph provides for them, if you remember the story of Joseph, he's reconnected with the brothers that sold him into slavery. And through a series of events, he moves his entire family, as we read in Exodus chapter 1, verse 5. 70 people to Egypt. But in Exodus chapter 1, the time of Joseph comes to an end. Joseph dies, his brothers die, and all the generation that knew Joseph passes away, and there arises a new generation. Isn't that how the world works? You know, we live in a world that's cyclical. Every generation rises and falls. Every generation is born and dies, and that will happen until Jesus comes back. And that's what happened with Joseph. The generation died away. And in verse 8, we learn that the king that knew Joseph died away. Now, if you remember, Joseph was highly favored in Egypt. He was well taken care of. In fact, when he went to go take Jacob's bones back, he was, he was accompanied by the greatest dignitaries in the court of Pharaoh. He was one of the highest regarded men in the known world and the second in command in the most powerful nation in the world. Joseph was an important guy. But when Joseph died and the Pharaoh that knew Joseph died, things changed. Haven't we experienced in our lifetime... Some of us have experienced it more than others because our life has been longer. That things change when leadership changes. Things change in a country. Things change in a state. And things can change in our own family when leadership changes. And that's what happens in Egypt. The leadership changes. And what rises up is a man who was not like the Pharaoh that knew Joseph. But was a hard and a scared man. Because that Pharaoh who we don't know his name. And it's an important thing that we don't know his name because there's a lot of debate about not knowing which Pharaoh this was and what Pharaoh enslaved the people of Israel. And the Egyptians were very prideful people, so if there was record of it, they would have got rid of it quick. The Egyptians enslaved the people of Israel. And you'll notice in verse 8, they were enslaved for a very specific reason. Pharaoh said this in verse 9. 
Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape the land. And so they set taskmasters over the people of Israel, and they put them to work, and they dealt with them terribly. They didn't just put them to work, they made their work hard and harder than it should have been. Have you ever worked for somebody like that? Maybe you have before. They gave you a job, but they made your job a little bit harder than it should have been. That's what Pharaoh and the taskmasters did. And they did it out of spite. They did it out of anger. And they did it out of fear. Because they were afraid that the people of Israel would rise up, join the armies around Egypt, and overtake the Egyptians. Now, that's not a good attitude for the person who is in control of the known world to have. When you're in control of the known world, you shouldn't fear your enemies in this way. But yet, this is how he did. And so, in order to not only eliminate the fact that the Israelites would rise up against Egypt... He said, I'm going to put another nail in the coffin. I'm going to work them so hard and make them such terrible slaves that they don't have the energy to fight against us if a nation comes to defeat us. And in addition to that, they're growing so rapidly. I'm going to make sure that they, can, they don't continue to grow. So every time that a Hebrew male, uh, a Hebrew male child is born, you've got to kill him. And he tells that to these Hebrew midwives. Our story this morning centers, at least for the point we're going to study, around the Hebrew midwives. There are many examples and lessons we can pull out of Exodus chapter 1. But what I want to talk to you about this morning is doing the right thing. And we learn that from the Hebrew midwives in Exodus chapter 1. Who were asked to do the wrong thing, but chose to do the right thing. We're going to look at three areas in this lesson. The first is we're going to ask the question about the Hebrew midwives. What were they up against? Then we're going to ask the question, what motivated them? And in the third place, we're going to talk about their bravery and courage. So let's start with our first point here this morning. What were the Hebrew midwives up against? The first is is found in Exodus chapter 1 and verse 12. The Hebrew midwives and the people of Israel as a whole were up against, up against human suffering. Here's a reality that you have probably experienced, and if you've not experienced it to this point, you will at some point. Every human is against human suffering. Every one of us has to deal with it and wrestle with it at some point in life. Some of us, unfortunately, wrestle it more than others. But we all experience it at some point. Exodus chapter 1 and verse 12 says, The more they were oppressed, the people of Israel were oppressed. The Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. And so, verse 13, they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves. They made their lives bitter. With hard service. In brick and mortar. All kinds of work in the field. In all their work. They ruthlessly made them work as slaves. The Bible tells us that the Hebrew midwives. And the people of Israel as a whole. Were up against human suffering. They had to fight against people. Who oppressed and restricted their life. Now please understand. This is not the way that Israel wanted to live. But this is where they found themselves. However, you and I, when we look at human suffering, will say there is no greater travesty. There is no greater problem in the world than the problem of human suffering. But I would say, I would like you to reconsider that. Suffering is terrible. The fact that you and I have to deal with difficulty in life is, is strangely terrible. But at the same time, doesn't suffering make us into better versions of ourselves? You think about what the Bible has to say about suffering. It is crystal clear that you and I grow against the weight of things that are meant to weigh us down. That's how muscle's grown, isn't it? You grow muscle by pushing against things that are meant to weigh you down. And as you resist something, you build and grow. That's the same thing with us as humans. The Bible tells us that the more they suffered in Israel, in Egypt, the Israelites, the more they multiplied. I want you to think about a passage in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 19. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 19, we learn a little fact about suffering. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 19. Suffering may be very challenging to us today, and it is suffering. But God's version and terms on suffering is much different than ours. What we would call difficulty, I believe God would call something different. It is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. If you and I had a choice, I believe we would say, we want to get rid of all human suffering. But God doesn't. We would say, I would never want anyone in this world to ever have another problem in life. But God doesn't. And it is often because when we look into the scriptures, suffering in the, t in the testing of a trial, we come out having stronger character, stronger resolve, and stronger hope. Do you remember James chapter 1? Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. You and I, as individuals, when we go through trials, come out on the other end of that trial stronger than we were before. Now, I want you to think about what would happen if, when the Israelites went into Egypt, they would not have suffered. We know the history of the Israelites. We know what they did when they went in the wilderness. We know what they did when they went to the land of Canaan. And we know what they did throughout the history of the Old Testament. Every time they got around another nation, they became just like the other nation, didn't they? They started to act just like them. They adopted their gods. They adopted their ways. They married their people. And they assimilated into every culture that they were a part of, except for Egypt. And why is that? Because in Egypt, they were oppressed. Israel would have gone into Egypt and been just like Egypt, except they were oppressed. And the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 13 and verse 17, as well as Genesis chapter 46 and verse 3, that God intended the people of Israel to grow into a great nation in Egypt. You know, one of the interesting things in the Bible, as you look at the people of Israel, and as you look into the New Testament and you look at the church of Jesus Christ, the people of Israel and the church of Jesus Christ both flourished in the midst of difficulty. The people of Israel and the church of Jesus Christ always flourishes in the midst of difficulty. And that was God's intention for the people of Israel. He wanted them to flourish. So the Hebrew midwives were up against suffering, but they were also up against Pharaoh, in Exodus chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, the Bible says that Pharaoh told his people, Behold, the people of Israel too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, let us multiply, lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Pharaoh was, in Exodus chapter 1, a scared and insecure man. And what he did was, he played the race card. For his people. And they took it hook, line, and sinker. These people are great. They're multiplying. They're much stronger than we are. So what will happen is if a nation comes in and this great multiplied nation is among us and they join the other nation, we're going to be squashed like a bug. Pharaoh was scared. And he was insecure about his own nation. And so he told his people, in order for us to protect our prosperity, in order for us to protect our well-being, we must absolutely demolish the people of Israel. We must weigh them down. We must work them to death and work them to the bone in order that they cannot do what we're afraid they will do. But you know what the irony is of Exodus chapter 1? The opposite of what Pharaoh wanted to happen happened. The more he pressed on the Israelites, the more they multiplied. The greater they got the harder the press was put on them. So the people of Israel and the midwives were up against suffering and they were up against Pharaoh. You know, in our suffering, it's interesting that we often look directly for a savior. We looked almost longingly for some savior to help us in the midst of suffering. And it helps us to keep perspective that this house of bondage is not permanent and that we're looking for the land of liberty, Romans chapter 5 and verse 3. So the people of Israel were up against something very challenging. 
But what they were up against did not keep them from doing what they ought to do. So number two, what motivated them? We see what the Hebrew people and the Hebrew midwives were up against. A Pharaoh that oppressed them, a Pharaoh that was scared, he was insecure about his own nation, and that wanted to keep them at bay so they would not overtake him. But the opposite came true. Here's what motivated them, Exodus chapter 1, and we're going to begin in verse 15. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of them who was named Sifra and the other Pua, when you serve as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. If it is a daughter, she shall live. Now, if you think about the purpose of a midwife, what her job was to come into a home when a woman was about to give birth to a child and to help in the most sacred moment usher in a life from being in the womb of the mother to being in the world around us and a life being present in her hands, being asked to do the opposite of her job. I cannot imagine the weight that those midwives felt at the request of Pharaoh. I want you to do the opposite of what you have planned to do. You have trained, you have planned, your job is to bring life into the world. I want you to end life as it comes into the world. This was Pharaoh's request. Verse 17, but the midwives feared Pharaoh? No. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them. But let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this? And let the male children live. The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They're vigorous. They give birth before the midwife even comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives. And the people multiplied and grew very strong. Verse 21. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Now, the Bible tells us that the motivation of the midwives was singular. They were not motivated by the promise of persecution. They were not motivated by the promise of reward from Pharaoh. And they were not, they were not motivated by a promise that God would bless them if they did what God said. You'll notice that God never told them what to do in the text. God never gives them instruction. In fact, Outside of the mention of a fear from God, that is the only utterance of his name in chapter 1. They didn't do what they did because God said, I'll reward you for being good. They did what they did because they feared God. Now, in the Bible, the term fear of the Lord is actually a really common phrase, but it doesn't mean what you and I would think it would mean. We would think meaning the fear of God meant that I'm scared of God, I'm afraid of God, and there's a sense that we'll talk about that, but saying the fear of God means I'm scared of God is like saying that a butterfly means a stick of butter's flying. It just doesn't work. It's a, it's a concept. It's not a description. A fear of God can be taken in the same way that the word butterfly can be. A fear of God does not mean that I'm afraid of his punishment, that I'm afraid of him. The fear of God is compared in the scriptures to many different things. For instance, Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise instruction. You see, the fear of God is compared in Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7 to listening to the instruction of God. The fear of God is listening to his word. The fear of God is used throughout the Bible to describe this. But one particular instance. Take your Bibles to Psalm 34. Jerome, we're going to look at verses 11 through 14. Psalm 34, verses 11 through 14. What motivated these midwives? It was the fear of God. And the fear of God does not necessarily mean I'm afraid of God, but it means that I will do what is right before God because I stand in awe and respect of him. His word, his commandments, his love, his grace, his mercy, his protection. The fact that he is God and I am not. I stand in fear of God. Psalm 34, beginning in verse 11. Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Okay, what is the fear of the Lord? Verse 12. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil 
and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. What is the fear of the Lord in Psalm 34 verses 11 through 14? It is keeping my tongue from evil, keeping my lips from deceit, turning away from evil to do good, and seeking peace and pursue it. Why? Verse 15, because the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous. I live in a fear of God because I want to do what God has said. It's not saying I'm scared of God. I'm afraid of God. It's saying that I respect and stand in awe of God. It is a positive attribute, and it's linked to wisdom and a desire to live a righteous life. Many of you have probably seen the classic C.S. Lewis movie, which was turned into a movie from a book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. In that movie, the children at this new home enter in a wardrobe while playing hide-and-seek. And they pass through this wardrobe into this amazing land that is unlike anything they've ever seen. They enter what is called Narnia. And in that movie, you see the events and the characters that play out in that particular movie. Now, as they go in, there is a beaver who stands as their guide. And that beaver briefly tells the children of Narnia about what the land is like. And he mentions the lion. Many of you have probably seen this and you remember the lion in this movie. If you haven't, you can go home and watch it. Uh, it's, it's a really neat movie. But he mentions the lion. Now, many of you remember what a lion's like. You've been to the Atlanta Zoo, maybe, and you've seen the lion sitting up there. You know, maybe you've actually been on a safari or, you know, the redneck safari that got down in LaGrange. And you've seen a lion, all right? So maybe you've seen that stuff before. And you've seen those powerful animals. They're not like your house cat, okay? They are powerful. And the children ask a common question. You and I would ask, is he safe? They hear of the lion, and they ask, is he safe? The beaver replies, of course not, but he is good. Now, in that, I believe we learn of the fear of the Lord. Is God safe? Is he not so powerful that he won't do what he says he'll do? That he's not filled with justice and wrath, but also mercy, goodness, and grace. Is he safe? No. He spoke the world into existence. He can do things beyond what you and I could even imagine, but he's good. And in that case, I stand in the awe of God. Why did the Hebrew midwives choose to go against what Pharaoh said? They chose to go against what Pharaoh said because they stood in fear of God. They were in awe of him, and they wanted to obey him above any other. So, the Hebrew midwives were up against suffering and a Pharaoh that wanted to oppress them. And they were motivated by a fear for God. So, our third statement this morning, and then I'll give you the lesson. It'll be yours to take home. Let's examine the bravery and the courage of these midwives. I believe the greatest lesson that we learn in this passage is from the midwives. We learn that in this passage, you don't have to be some extraordinary person in high authority to be impactful on the world for the will of God. You see, in this story, and we're starting a series this morning on the life of Moses, which begins in Exodus chapter 1. And we have to have this context to understand what happens next week in Exodus chapter 2. Because as we study Exodus chapter 1, what we learn is God is using everyday ordinary people to accomplish his will. Now think about this. The most powerful man in the known world is in chapter 1. And we do not know his name. But what we would consider in the scheme of things, two of the least significant people in this story. But we know their name. You see, God records their name because they did what was right. The book of Exodus is not a, a book where we're poised and, and, and positioned to say, Who was Egypt? The book of Exodus is written to poise and position us to ask, Who is God? Who is the God that these midwives feared that they would go against the most powerful man in the world? And it's in that that we learn this story of Moses, that it can be summarized by Exodus chapter 1. Ordinary, everyday people choosing to live as faithful children living faithful lives. When we choose to be faithful, I believe it is blatantly obvious God can use us. When we choose to be faithful to him. Now notice, these women, there was no external promise to them. No promise that in a few 
weeks or months or however long it was from chapter 1 to chapter 2, there's going to be a woman, and we don't even know her name in chapter 2, but she's going to meet another man. They're both going to be Levites, and they're going to get married, and then they're going to have a child, and she's going to look at that baby boy, obviously scared because she's had a boy, and boys are being killed, and she's going to keep him for three months until she can't hide him anymore, and then she's going to put him in a little basket in the river, and her, his older sister is going to watch, and then Pharaoh's daughter is going to come and take him out of the river, and he's going to live in Pharaoh's house for 40 years, and then after that, he's going to kill an Egyptian and run out into the wilderness. He's going to live in the wilderness for 40 years. And when he's 80 years old, God's going to call him back to Egypt and he's going to save the people of Israel. Those women didn't know that. They didn't know that God was going to, in Exodus chapter 1 and verse 21, bless them with families because of the decision they made. There was no external promise of a blessing. And yet they simply just chose to do right. When you and I break it all down, when we boil it down, Life, struggle, and faithfulness can be summed up to this. If you and I are willing to do this, I believe God can use you in whatever way he sees fit to accomplish his will. And it's summarized in the story of the midwives that we choose to do the next right thing. Just the next right decision. Just make the next right decision. You may not be able to control where this country is in a hundred years. You may not be able to control where this congregation is in the next four decades. And you may not even be able to feel like you're in control of what happens in your own life in the next year. But you don't have to worry about that because God's message in this story, I believe, is that you and I can just choose to make the next right decision. Now imagine how your life would change if your decision was, I'm just going to worry about the next right choice. Whatever comes up next, whatever thing happens, whether it's, you know, the red light in Bowden, it turns yellow, I'm going to gas it or break it. Whether it's I picked up a $100 bill off the ground, or whether it's someone's asked me to do something immoral, but I fear God more. doesn't matter what the next decision is. If you'll just determine, I will choose to do the next right thing. Imagine where your life would be in accomplishing the will of God. These midwives aren't leading Israel out of bondage. They aren't fighting against the Egyptian army. And yet this decision, this next right decision, had an impact that was larger than they could ever imagine. Maybe that's the case for you and I. God works through this entire story through faithful people living faithful lives. So my encouragement to you this morning is to be a faithful person, living a faithful life, and making the next right decision. And use these midwives as an example. The greatest impact that you can have is to be that faithful person living a faithful life. When you wake up, when you walk into work, when you walk into school tomorrow, are you living a faithful life? Do my children in my home know that I just, I'm going to make the next right thing? I'm going to make that next right decision. Do the people at work know that I'm living a faithful life? It means doing the next right thing. Many of you are probably familiar with the story that came out of World War II. Uh, I, I just read the particulars of this uh, in preparation for this lesson, but I'll share it with you and we'll deliver the invitation. During World War II, as Jews were being systematically hunted down and marked for death, offering them safe haven meant risking imprisonment and death. Yet, Caspar Ten Boom, when asked why he was willing to take such a risk, commented this. It would be an honor to give my life for God's ancient people. Soon after stating this conviction, Casper and his four children and his nephew were taken into custody after being betrayed as members in the underground in Holland. All told, they had saved an estimated 800 Jews. When they faced the horror of a Nazi prison camp, only one of Casper's daughters, Corey, survived. And this brave woman went on to inspire millions, sharing a message of God's unfailing love and the power of forgiveness. You and I never know where a courageous stand will lead us in life. We never know what will happen when we just make the next right choice. But I hope you do. I hope you just make the next right choice. And if you worry about that, then I think you'll be all right. And God will use you for his will. Maybe this morning the next right choice for you is coming to God. Maybe that's because you're a child of God and you strayed away from him. And the next right choice for you is just stepping out from the pew and coming down to repent. Say, I need to do better. Maybe the next right choice for you is during the invitation song to pray to God and say, God, forgive me because I've done wrong and I want to do right. 
Maybe the next right choice for you is to come down and say, I'm not a child of God. I want to become a child of God. And I know that we can do that here. And we can make that a reality today. Whatever the case is, whatever stands in front of you, I want to encourage you to make the next right choice and use these midwives as your example. If there is any need this morning, please come as we stand and sing.